All right, let's talk about the characterization of superconductors and also YBCO. Um, so these are things that we're going to do during the lab, uh, and we have uh, numerous sort of demo or tutorial videos um, on the actual procedure, but I'll show you some other um, procedural steps today as we go through this. So this is not a sort of definitive list, but this is just stuff. Uh, these are things that we're going to do uh, for our lab. Uh, keep in mind there can be other ways to characterize, and I'll try to highlight those um, as we go through. All right. So the first one maybe sounds simple, but I do want to uh, look over uh, how we determine density uh, and also some of the aspects related to density. All right, so density is really simple, as you probably are aware, right? We uh, take the sample mass and we divide by volume, right? So um, if it is very uniform shape, then we can do the mass and then calculate the volume from the dimensions. And it's really straightforward to get that number. If we have a sort of unique shape, it may not be easy to calculate that volume. And so there are other methods. Uh, most notably, there is Archimedes method. Um, this is, uh, there is an ASTM, uh, as you can see down here, uh, for how to do this. But more or less, um, you look at the buoyancy of the material and the volume is obtained from that. And so this is one way that we could potentially measure the density of our samples um, if uh, the simple sort of calculation of mass and dimensions uh, is not enough. All right, so the main thing here, though, I wanted to look at is not necessarily how to calculate density, but how can we have uh, what may cause uh, deviations from the theoretical density. So in the pre-lab, uh, you came up with a, a density for YBCO, right? So that specific number uh, is not what we're going to get in this lab. And so we want to look at the causes. And so let's sort of go one by one. The first one uh, is related to our structure. So as you can see here, 7 minus x or 7 minus delta in some resources. Um, oxygen obviously weighs um, uh, some amount, right? And so uh, if you have a varying amount of oxygen content, that will affect the mass of YBCO and therefore the density of YBCO. So that's one, one way we can think of it. So if we have varying oxygen content, that uh, can affect the density. Um, also porosity, right? So when we're calculating uh, density, um, air or a vacuum, you know, uh, presence of something like that in the sample, so if we have pores uh, in our sample, that's gonna uh, definitely affect the density of our sample. A very porous material is less dense than uh, a very um, a packed material. So that's another way. Um, also, uh, it's possible in this system to get multiple crystal structures. So different crystal structures have uh, different densities. And so that's another way uh, that we can look at this. And also impurities, right? If we have some other uh, impurity that's not supposed to be there, um, that could affect the, the density of the theoretical YBCO, what we'd expect there. So what you know, you're being asked to do in this lab then is you know, calculate density, but also think about what is causing the differences in density. Is it the variable oxygen content? Well, if it is, um, you know, you are calculating the oxygen content through titration, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, is it porosity? And think about how that can affect um, the uh, structure. Um, is it different crystal structures? We are going to do x-ray diffraction, which will give us information about crystal structures. Um, and is it impurities, which we could also see uh, uh, from XRD as, as well. So the, the goal here is, can you identify the source or sources that are causing the deviations? And also, um, how great of a difference will they cause, right? What is the relative effect of porosity versus oxygen content? So that's something else to think about as well. And so those calculations are very easy uh, to do. All right, so beyond that, the errors in actually measuring density uh, are quite obvious. And, and this is, uh, so if I was using caliper or micrometer, 
uh, then it's obviously going to depend on the precision of those instruments. Uh, for this lab this semester, since we are doing it remotely, uh, it's going to depend on the uh, the ruler and the uh, process of uh, image analysis, right? That's uh, what's going to affect uh, the error in these density measurements. Also, if there's any irregularities in shape, right, this is going to cause errors in the measurement of volume. So all of these are things that you should think about as you're going through the, the data. And also the balance, right? So any uh, precision related to the mass balance. All right, so let's look at how we determine crystal structure and also the presence of impurities through X-ray diffraction or XRD. So XRD uh, or X-ray diffraction uh, is something that we use to determine the phase or phases that exist uh, in a material. And so this is something that we have a whole lab on in MSE 408. So we're not going to get the same sort of level of detail that we have in this class or in that class, uh, but we will use it as a tool to see if we can determine differences in the different states of the powder that we have. And so I posted some articles uh, to Canvas uh, in the supplemental reading section uh, of this lab that talk about the YBCO crystal structure data. So in this particular uh, reference, which again is in the, the Canvas folder, it looks at uh, different XRD patterns uh, for different conditions and what the structure is. So there's different structures depending on how uh, it is processed. And so that's kind of what we want to do. We're not going to have as detailed of an understanding of XRD in this semester, uh, but we'll kind of use it as a way to, we have a pattern for this particular sample that we ran um, and is it similar or is it similar to for example this blue pattern or is it similar to the the uh, fuchsia pattern up here so that's kind of the level that we want to do is um, can we uh, compare similarities and differences uh, between the different patterns that we record and those in the literature and see what that tells us about the structure and what phase or phases that we have in these materials all right, so I have a, a video uh, showing you how we actually prep the sample for XRD. So obviously, uh, look at that as you're going through the data. But let's sort of just quickly go over how we how we do that. So uh, there are multiple ways uh, in which to prepare uh, uh, X-ray diffraction for for powder. So powder X-ray diffraction. Uh, but the way that we use is to take an amorphous substrate, in this case a glass slide. Uh, and we apply an amorphous grease, which is vacuum grease, which is also, again, amorphous, and it's a very thin layer. Uh, and the idea is that this grease will uh, cause the powder, the YBCO powder, to stick and will create a very thin coating uh, that can be used for analysis. And since everything else is amorphous, uh, it won't uh, affect the, the results. And so that's kind of the, the procedure that you'll see here and also see in the, in the video. So definitely look at that video. All right, so again, for the analysis here, you know, what are you looking for? So what we're looking for is, um, and, you know, if you remember from MSC 201 or other classes, the peak location right, the two theta value, uh, and also uh, something you may have not have talked about in uh, 201, but the relative intensity, so how large the peaks are. Both of those are important. The peak location tells you about the despacing, the spacing of certain planes, and the relative intensity can tell you um, some information about that structure as well. And so what we want to do is we want to look at our peak locations and relative intensities and see if we can kind of match it with other phases that we have in the literature for YBCO. Other things we want to be on the lookout for um, are, are there extra peaks in our sample? And where could that come from? Um, if we can determine the, the lattice parameters, we want to definitely calculate the lattice parameters of this structure to compare to the literature. Um, and then um, what other phases might be present? So thinking back to this whole process of synthesizing YBCO, um, you should have some ideas of other phases that might be present if the ideal scenario 
uh, of the synthesis, synthesis didn't happen, right? right? So think about all of these things as you're going through the analysis and make sure to look at the literature and compare your results uh, to those. All right, so uh, calculating last parameters is something else we can do from the diffraction peak. So here I, I put up some uh, equations and so forth um, for doing that. Um, so in 201, you probably did this for a cubic system, right? So if you know the peak location, that tells you uh, the interplanar spacing uh, from that two theta uh, location. And so from that, we can also calculate the lattice parameter, right? So we can do that for the system, but also orthorhombic or any structure that we have. This is just some examples of other uh, materials. All right, so we've looked at um, uh, the phases that are present. Uh, and I mentioned before that we also want to determine the oxygen content, right? We want to be able to determine the seven minus X or seven minus Delta. And the way that we can do this is through uh, a titration. Um, so this may be a different type of titration than you've done in chemistry classes. So we'll go over a little bit on that, but this allows us to determine oxygen. All right. So, What's really happening here when we use this uh, ideometric titration is we're not directly solving the oxygen content. In essence, what we're finding is the oxidation state of copper. So copper in the structure, uh, you saw in the, in the structure, it had multiple uh, sites, right? In the planes or in those ribbons. And so this copper uh, can have uh, different valence state or oxidation states uh, in it, whereas yttrium and barium are fixed oxidation states. So they don't vary, uh, and also the oxidation, oxidation state of oxygen doesn't vary. So really the only thing that changes is copper. And so we're using this technique to figure out what the oxidation state of copper is, and then the only other thing that can vary in the structure is the oxygen content uh, or the seven minus X or Delta, right? So that's what we're doing. Um, because the other are again, single oxidation states. All right, so the steps that we have here to do this, and again, there'll be a video to show you how this is done and how to do the calculations. And there's also a handout to follow uh, as you go through that. But the first thing that's done is we dissolve the YBCO. So the powder uh, is dissolved in hydrochloric acid. And so what this does is it gives us the copper ions in solution. And so those copper ions react with uh, I minus in the uh, potassium iodide. And they react in such a way to give us I2, right? So that's formed and it gives us this uh, color. So iodide is uh, this brownish color in solution. And so uh, we have a certain amount of copper ions from uh, our mass of material. And so we're going to make a certain amount of this iodide. And so to get that amount, we're going to titrate this uh, I2 uh, against sodium thiosulfate. So basically this sodium thiosulfate will react with I2, um, and it'll do such in, in such a way that changes the color. So the concentration of uh, I2 is uh, when it's very dilute, um, uh, and uh, zero is clear. When it's higher, it's this brown color. So we use uh, this color change uh, as a way of determining determining the titration endpoint. Um, and so the basically going from this brown to the clear is what we're looking for. And at the very end. Um, because it gets very dilute in color as well, we actually add a starch. So the starch solution sort of intensifies the color and turns it this purple color. And then right when um, all of the uh, iodide is done, uh, gone, um, it will go clear. So it'll go very, uh, very rapidly from this purple to the clear, indicating sort of a more precise indication of what the endpoint and how much you have to uh, titrate against, but it's only added at very dilute concentrations. And again, uh, look at the video to see how this uh, is done and to get the data. Uh, there'll be lots of photos and so forth to, to get that. All right, so that allows us to get oxygen content.
Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to look at the Meissner effect, right? We want to start to evaluate the actual superconducting properties of our YBCO. And so this is going to be a very simple experiment. So really what we're going to do um, is what you might imagine. We're going to have some type of tray um, and we're going to put a superconductor in that vessel. And then we're going to cool down the superconductor, our YBCO, until it's um, at the boiling point of liquid nitrogen, right? So basically you put it in liquid nitrogen and so you assume that you're at that temperature. And so we're below the critical temperature and then we're going to place a magnet uh, above the superconductor and look at the levitation, right? So we're going to look at this levitation that occurs. And so this is obviously going to be a very fun part of the lab, and I'm, I apologize that you aren't uh, in the lab getting to do this. Um, so uh, definitely watch the videos, and, and uh, when you come back to campus uh, next year, we'll definitely uh, make sure we can do this if you uh, still want to have some of these opportunities. Um, but um, so it's obviously a fun part of the lab, and um, you know, I, you know, I just want you to see that it, it superconducts. Uh, but another part um, is we can get some data from this as well. So um, this height, so we can, again, take pictures um, and record the height at which the magnet levitates, right? And so the magnet is going to have a certain magnetic field associated with it. It's going to have a certain mass associated with it. And these are all values that will be given to you. Um, and so from this, we can do a balance of forces, right? So the mass of the magnet uh, and then uh, the repulsion or exclusion of the magnetic field from the Meissner effect. Uh, and we can basically come up with um, what that height should be, right? So if it's a perfect superconductor and it expels all of the magnetic field from the magnet, and uh, we can determine a height. And so this height is dependent on the size. So you see mass, uh, gravity, the radius, but also the magnetization M of the, the magnet, right? And so part of what you'll do with this um, um, lab, or this part of the lab, is to uh, calculate the height that uh, a magnet levitates over your superconductor and then compare it to what this uh, theoretical uh, height should be, and then try to come up with what you think the difference is. So why is it not at this equilibrium height based on this model? So what are some differences there, and why is it not reaching that position? Or if it does reach that height or even higher, try to explain what that could be a result of. All right, so we've talked a lot about uh, physical properties, phases, uh, oxygen content, um, and then the Meissner effect. So now let's look at probably one of the, the most critical things here, the, the critical temperature. So if we have a superconductor, and um, so that means that it's a perfect conductor below a certain temperature, we want to know what that temperature is, right? And so there's going to be multiple ways we can get this critical temperature. Uh, one of the um, easiest ways you might think of is, well, it's supposed to be zero resistance, so let's measure resistivity and do it as a function of temperature. So that sounds easy. Um, and the way that we could do this is by a four point probe method. And so what that entails is we've got our superconductor down here and we basically have four leads or probes. Uh, two of them are uh, volts. So we are uh, imposing a certain voltage uh, across these. And then the other one basically measures the current that flows. And so the reason we do this four point probe method is because we tend to have um, really high contact resistances. So in a typical ceramic or other material where there's uh, really low conductivity at the higher temperatures, uh, we need this type of method uh, to get those conductivities. And so four point probe is, is an eff effective way. Uh, we've done this in the past uh, and it's not very successful to us. Uh, and so we don't use this method, but it is a, a method that can be um, can be used is to measure this uh, conductivity or resistivity and do it as a function um, of temperature. So just vary the temperature with some type of chamber. 
so the other one of the other ways that we can measure critical temperature is the way that we're going to use in the lab um, so basically what we have is we have a circuit set up and i'll explain this in a little bit but more or less we have an inductor and so this inductor if you think about it is if we just have wire that's looped uh, around a, a cylinder right there'll be a magnetic field that's generated uh, within that cylinder right so having that inductor and having uh, an ac voltage which is what we have with this function generator we can induce a magnetic field inside this cylinder and we've already seen that with our superconductors um, we should be able to oppose that applied magnetic field right through the meisner effect and so if we place um, our superconductor inside the cylinder where there's a magnetic field there is going to be differences um, to the magnetization above and below the critical temperature right because it's going to oppose that applied magnetic magnetic field and so it's going to uh, oppose that applied magnetic field and it will manifest that as a signal in our circuit right so we'll get differences in the current that flows and the voltage that is across that inductor and so we use those measurements to get where that transition occurs all right so that inductor this copper coil that we have we uh, again apply an alternating current that applies a magnetic field so you might remember that from a circuits or a physics uh, class so this is kind of what that would look like from a cross section um, and so again our current or our sorry superconductor pellet is going to oppose that um, below the critical temperature so if we make this measurement as a function of temperature then we should be able to find out where that change in the magnetic field is and use that to calculate critical temperature so a couple things that we'll spell out um, as we go through the uh, magnetic susceptibility measurements uh, and you watch those videos and you look through the data is you'll want to note the number of turns that you have in the coil because that will affect the uh, the field strength and also the height uh, so the height of the actual um, coil as well so those factors will go into calculating the the magnetic field and also into some of the calculations all right so basically uh, this is what we'll get when we uh, run this experiment so we're going to look at inductance uh, in the coil and if we look at this as a function of temperature uh, above the critical temperature we're going to have a, a fixed or near uh, nearly fixed uh, level of inductance in the coil because nothing's happening right then we're going to get to a certain point where the inductance changes and then at the below the critical temperature we're also at a relatively fixed value of inductance and so that transition region is our critical temperature and so the common way to measure this is to take the inductance above and take the induct inductance below uh, divide that by two so we get a midpoint so in this case it's a little over eight this red dotted line here and then we find the temperature at that midpoint of the inflection and so that would be what we term the critical temperature so that's something that's important during this experiment um, also um, you know so this is a, a fairly nice curve that you see um, ours may not look perfect may not look perfect it's experimental data so some of the other things that you should be looking at when you're looking at these curves um, is not only the the critical temperature but also note how much uh, what's the range over which temperatures which we have this transition that can tell you about the quality of the superconductor is it very sharp or is it very broad uh, so you want to look at things like that as well all right so yeah like i said our raw data doesn't necessarily look like this so for our susceptibility we often have to do uh, some things to analyze this all right so for ours for our magnetic susceptibility uh, analysis uh, we have a run where we um, take your superconducting pellet put it in this coil and run it uh, from the low temperature up to the high temperature and so this black curve is more or less what we get from that run 
And so you can see this sharp transition, but you can also kind of see this curvature that happens as well. So if we repeat that run without the YVCO or without the superconductor, what that run looks like is here in red. So it's kind of flat, um, and then it decreases and goes back up. And this can vary, the shape of this can vary a little bit. But one of the things to think about here is that if we just think about the coil, the inductor itself, right? This is copper. This uh, is a copper coil and it's very long, right? So there's a resistance associated with this copper. And so that resistance is also a function of temperature. Right? So the, the resistivity of copper changes with temperature. And so by running it without the superconductor, we can find out that relationship on the inductor and we can subtract it during the analysis. So when we calculate it, we'll take the uh, V over I, so the, the uh, potential over the current for the run with the superconductor minus uh, the resistance of just the coil itself. And so that will allow us to subtract out the temperature dependence of the copper coil. And so there'll be more information again as we go along um, in the, uh, the data for magnetic susceptibility. All right, so again, other things to, to consider when we're doing this susceptibility analysis. Um, temperature. Temperature is obviously very critical here. Um, so we will, um, if there is any uh, adjustment that needs to be done or correction to the temperature, that's something that you want to note. So oftentimes our thermocouple isn't perfect, and so we have to make a correction to what the thermocouple gives us. We also want to obviously determine the critical temperature. That's the most important part. Um, and then also, um, in the handout, there's calculations for how we calculate the susceptibility. And so this term, which we've been using throughout, is the quantity that we use to determine if something is a perfect diamagnet or not. And so by calculating susceptibility, we can see if our superconductor is a diamagnet uh, like we expect for superconductors and how good it is. And so that will be important to calculate uh, as well. Also, I mentioned the, the width of that transition region. You want to kind of note that. And if there's any sort of irregularities, uh, is it uniform or is it multiple steps? You want to note all these types of things uh, in your analysis.